Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have to admit I'm a little intimidated uh, following my colleagues. Um, I've, uh, I'm familiar with both of their research and, and know their work a good bit, so I knew they would have highly organized presentations. Um, Sabina said I could re recount this story about the time we went to lunch, and uh, the time came to go to the cash register, and she said, I will pay. I am German. Do not argue. <laughs> and so I, I had the sense of following these two incredible presentations, and so I'm a little intimidated. Plus, it's almost as bad as at the time a, a friend asked me to do a, a time management seminar. And I said, you want me to do a time management seminar? <laughs> it's like having the NSA uh, present a privacy workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite as... Uh, 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 quite that bad when it comes to the to this topic of mentoring, but I would preface anything I would say uh, with the caveat that I, I feel like I'm continuing a journey of learning how to become a mentor, and uh, I think it's sort of a uh, a lifetime of adjusting to this crazy profession we're all in to see how to to deliver mentoring at its very best. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that we all got asked to do this because I think it made me think a little bit about um, a philosophy that I've kind of developed over the years, but have not really had to articulate until the time came to, to give this presentation. And in thinking about it, I've settled on, on kind of a theme for my, uh, thankfully from your perspective, very brief remarks, um, and that is one of availability and the idea that we should make ourselves as much as possible available to students outside of the classroom um, so that we can offer the kinds of unofficial mentoring that, that can um, build on what we're telling the students in the classroom. Um, and I have some caveats to all of that, but uh, as I began, let me, let me observe that when we all come out of graduate school, we are emerging from a dissertation and research process that has given us uh, a model for mentoring graduate students. And I think that one reason that we are all so very comfortable uh, with mentoring graduate students is that we, in fact, were mentored. And we understand to take students to conferences, to tell them how they're to behave, to tell them how they're to present, to give them advice on the job search, because it's very easy for us to, to remember our own, own journey along those lines. I think that mentoring for undergraduates is, uh, in fact, quite different. Uh, because like Sabina, many of us didn't have the strongest mentoring uh, as undergraduates. Either we didn't have very much, uh, or we had some that was, that was momentous, but um, not so much that we came into our teaching jobs with the role models for undergraduate mentoring that we had for graduate mentoring. So the model I found myself sort of um, settling into is, is one that I consider that I'm, I'm labeling availability. And perhaps this is due to a couple of things. One, to the job I currently hold as Dean of the Honors College. Uh, and second, just to my uh, reputation, as some of you might agree, as something of a glad hander. Apologies. Um, I enjoy being with students, as I know many of you do and all of you do. Um, but I also think that there are incredible opportunities that come by making ourselves available to students uh, outside of class. And in discussing this with uh, an incredible, an, an incredibly complicated focus group, that is, I talked to it, one student about it this morning, <laughs> um, she agreed that um, we, as uh, the powerful one in that you know, dichotomous relationship between professor and student, we need to make it clear to the students that we are inviting them to come to us for the wide range of out-of-class mentoring that we're discussing. And I think that for so many of these students, they are so intimidated by us. It's, it's hard for me to get my head around the idea that anybody would be intimidated by me. There are kittens that are not intimidated by me. <laughs> but yet, because of the differential and power relationships, uh, students really are intimidated by us. And I think they need as much as possible an invitation to come forward to us uh, whenever um, we can extend that invitation. Uh, my student Michelle this morning said it really made a difference for her when students said, I would like for you to come to my office and talk to me uh, about this project. 
She said that express um, invitation gave her the permission to come to a professor's office. She said, and she was able to articulate this in a way that I couldn't in thinking about it in the abstract, she said that she was never sure when it was appropriate to bring something to a professor. And she reminded me of a conversation we had had uh, a semester ago when she was pushing up her graduation plans. She said as she started to raise that issue with me, and I know this student pretty well. Um, I advise a student organization she's a part of. She said she wasn't sure that that was something appropriate to ask me. And it was about moving up for graduation. So even, even the best students, those with whom we are comfortable, still see a certain barrier. So um, what I try to do is make myself available to students outside of class and make it clear to them that I am willing to be available to them. Uh, and then when I am around them, even if it's only in the hall or a brief moment outside of my office, uh, I offer a lot of unsolicited advice. Now, we were all raised, I'm sure your mother told you, that you probably should keep your opinions to yourself when it comes to giving people advice. Um, but I'm trying to get over that. And I think that in so many areas, uh, our students need our advice. And if they don't hear it from us, you know where they get it, don't you? They get it from the kid down the hall in their dorm. And um, I think that, that we have this incredible wealth of information for the students, of course in, co in class content, but we have this incredible wealth of information about how the university works and about how the system works and obviously about how our curricula work. Um, we have this incredible store of information and students need to feel comfortable enough to come to us to help them problem solve um, in ways that without us, they don't have any idea about the solution. So uh, I think this, this um, principle of availability that I would uh, argue for, in fact, gives us a chance to intervene and offer advice on moving up your graduation or on um, getting a course substitution um, that they would not get otherwise. When students hear the first no, and if they hear an answer to a question from uh, the staffer who answers the phone, they take that as definitive. They don't know that there are all kinds of workarounds that only you and I know about uh, in an entire range uh, of events. So I think um, that the other principle that I would fall back on is, is a general principle of encouragement. And uh, most of my colleagues over the years um, have, have agreed with this. I've had a, a, a few uh, folks who've pushed back on this. Um, I always said in the 90s that when I ever began a sentence, I've been here 20 years and I think that I should quit, but I've been here 20 years and what I, <laughs> um, I, I've only encountered one colleague who saw uh, problems with the encouragement model that I like to pursue. And this colleague argued that, um, that being nice to students, and these were his words, uh, was, was babying them. I don't think it's babying them. I think it's entirely possible to hold students to incredibly high standards and yet be very encouraging to them and correcting them uh, for their mistakes. Uh, and I think that with this sort of model of encouragement, if they see you as an encouraging professor, and again, I know, I, I know I'm, uh, I'm preaching to the choir here, I think that if they see you as this model of encouragement, they have a sense that they're going to be able to come to you for problems, issues, uh, further explanations, uh, of matters inside class and out. Uh, one thing that I, that I try to explain to students, and this is in my writing class, is that they need to be able, early in college, to separate criticism of their work, the assignment they did for you, uh, from criticism of their soul. And I will tell them, you know, when, when we're talking about this um, article you wrote, we're not talking about you, the person. We're talking about words you put on paper. And um, particularly freshmen, particularly freshmen have a hard time with that concept and with taking criticism. And I explain to students, as I know you do, that this idea that you can take criticism uh, um, and, 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 and learn from it means that you're starting the journey of a lifelong learner that is one of the goals of college. But um, I, I think that students need to understand that explicitly uh, so that they can benefit from the kinds of things that, um, that we're talking to them about. 
Um, there are limits to our availability. Um, there are very much limits. Um, I encourage my students to get uh, appointments with me. Drop-ins are great. I think that when a student has a, um, a pressing issue, there is nothing that says to a student um, any louder their importance to you as a student than dropping everything and dealing with them. But the fact of the matter is, much of the time you just can't do that. So I tell students, my time is not my own, and I will give you all the time I possibly can, uh, but you need to make an appointment. And I, I really uh, try to stress that, that they need to, to make an appointment with me. I also give students my cell number. And that is my Google Voice number that forwards to my cell. When it shows up as a Google Voice call, I know exactly that it's a student calling me. The students think they have access to me through my cell. And it's true, my cell rings. Um, but in point of fact, I get to choose whether this is an issue I'm really going to tackle at that moment in time. Giving them my cell means I have availability to them on my terms. And it means that I can problem solve doing the back and forth of a telephone conversation in three minutes, what might take me three or four days doing over email. So I found that that really works. Uh, the other limit I put, and I'm happy to share this with you all as my time winds down, is uh, I have requirements for letters of recommendation. For years when I'm, I'm convinced that, I've, I've been convinced that uh, if, if I do go to the, to the very fiery place in the depths of hell, the first thing the devil will say is, your desk is here, the stack of letters of recommendation is waiting. <laughs> And I have no problem writing letters of recommendation. And if, if you're encouraging to students, and you're nice to students, um, and you work with students, they're going to ask you to write a letter of recommendation. And I'm fine for the students I know well to do that, and, and I ask nothing further. But for the student has, who has run into me in the hall twice, but yet wants me to write a, a letter of recommendation, I have them um, fill out a, I have, I, I have a template email. This is what I'll share with you all. It's this long. <coughs> that says you need to give me all of this information. What are you applying for? Give me your resume uh, and all of this information. That scares about two thirds of them and I never get it. <laughs> but I think that's okay. If they're asking me to spend an hour doing a recommendation letter, is it not fair for me to ask them to spend 30 minutes pulling together material uh, for me to pull together the same? Uh, I also make them write me a thank you note. And I go to the mailbox, y'all, and I open these thank you notes, and I get all dewy-eyed, and then I remember, oh, yeah, I made them do this. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell them that, if, that if, if they're asking someone to do a favor, uh, they really need to, um, they really need to, to recognize uh, what they've done. Um, last but not least, I'll repeat uh, a tip. Uh, that uh, I offered in a teaching workshop a year or so back that I happened to run into to a colleague, uh, I think she's here, uh, a couple of days ago about doing video introductions. I think students appreciate it when you, when you, um, when you know their names. And so in some classes I have my students do introductions of themselves on video uh, and that's helped me learn some names which uh, I think the students appreciate. And, um, and I tell them what I'm doing. But I also think they, I learn from it, but I think that they appreciate the signal that I'm sending um, that um, uh, learning their names is important. Uh, my friend Larry Strout, who teaches at Mississippi State, I'd still hold that against him. He used to teach at Southern Miss. Um, uh, when we were discussing mentoring once, and I'll close with this, he said that he's found that he can give off almost any advice in the world if he attributes it to someone else. And he says that, uh, so if he has to tell a student something, he'll say, well, you know, a friend of mine says that really the best way to look at this is thus and such, thus and such, thus and such. And so what you've done is you've, you've broadened the pool of potential experts. Um, you, you've taken yourself off the pedestal as the expert, which my mother would certainly have wanted me to do. Um, and you've um, given yourself a little more e leeway in offering uh, the kinds of advice that so many students need. Thank you.